Hello, welcome to another Lessons from Locust Grove. My name is Kelly Stevenson and I'm a volunteer at Locust Grove. I'm going today to tell you about the process of fiber preparation in the time of Locust Grove. Louder. So, there are three major fibers that were used at that time. Cotton, people today are very familiar with, but you don't often think of that it grows on a plant and uh, I guess adults do, kids don't. And uh, that you had to have the process of cotton production. It did not grow well in this area, so there was not a lot of that here in Louisville. Wool was uh, one of the really common, obviously fairly easy to obtain fibers, and flax to make linen was the other. So I'm gonna walk through the steps of producing fiber from wool. So of course the first step is to get it off of the sheep. So we've got some traditional shears here to shear it off the sheep, and then there's a certain amount of washing and picking out the bugs and grass and stuff that happens to get in one's coat when you live outside all year. And then once you have it in a reasonable shape, you need to card it. So these are wool cards it on there and basically you're just brushing it out trying to straighten out the fibers fluff it up a little bit and maybe get out any remaining debris so once it is all brushed you'll get your nice fluffy wool off of the cards and now it is ready to spin into yarn the oldest way to spin wool into yarn is to use a drop spindle and it's called a drop spindle because it is using gravity to stretch out as I make this thread. But all spinning does is twist this wool. Yarn is just twisted fiber. And so, see, it will get longer and longer as it twists more and more of this. And when I get enough, then I can stop and wind it on and then I'm ready to do some more to make more yarn. As you can see, this is a fairly lengthy process, but people did this for tens of thousands of years. This is how they did it. A technological advance way before the Victorian era was a spinning wheel. And there are many different kinds of spinning wheels, but I'm gonna show you one to show how it does the same process a little more efficiently. So this is a fairly typical spinning wheel design. Um, the way the spinning wheel works is this bigger wheel is making a smaller wheel here turn, which is ultimately twisting the yarn, just like the spindle was when I was using the drop spindle. It is just twisting this into yarn. The advantage here is, see how it pulls onto this bobbin at the same time that it is spinning. I don't need to stop and wind it. It winds it as it goes. So that was a big advance of this type of spinning wheel. The earliest spinning wheels were still two stage. You still had to spin it and then wind it. But this did both at the same time. So you could spin faster and get more done. So you can see how I'm using my foot here to make the wheel spin, which is another thing that allows my fingers more freedom. This was important particularly when you are spinning up flax into linen. You need both hands. It's a harder process to get it to spin, so you've got to be able to have both hands available. So having your foot drive the wheel made sense. Now once I get this all full of wool. I'm going to have this nice bobbin of wool. And I need to get it off of there. And I always share this because this is my favorite name of any of the tools. This is a nitty knotty. And the nitty knotty works by just, you take this and tie it around and these are all tangled, but you twist it to wind it off of the bobbin 
onto the knitting knotting to get your skein of yarn that you can then do things with. So you saw that I was spinning a brown yarn, and that was just the color of that sheet. And there's lots of different shades of grays and browns that you can get. But of course, you can also get white wool. You saw a little bit of that when I was carding. You might want some colors besides white, brown, and gray for your clothes. So another step that you might do at any step of this process, actually, is dye it. Now, we're talking about times in history where all they had available were natural dyes. So we have several fibers here that have all been dyed with natural things that were available at that time. Except for this very first one, all of these come from plants. This actually comes from an insect. The color to get this uh, is called cochineal, and this actually comes from some kind of insect uh, exoskeleton make that color. You grind it up and boil it, and it can get a lot darker red. This one's faded some over time, which is a lot of these have. But the rest of these all come from plants, and some of these plants are grown specifically for their dye. In particular, indigo and madder. Indigo is one of the most famous plants grown for its dye and it makes a beautiful range of blues. Depending on how long you leave it in the dye, you can get from a light blue to a very dark indigo color. Matter gives shades of orange and reddish oranges. Again, this is faded some, uh, but it can get more red than this, but it's an orangey color. Other things here have come from other plants. Flowers, onion skins, and then there's the green. You would think it might be easy to find green. There's a lot of green in the world. But to make a good green that stains, the best way they found to do it was actually to dye it yellow and then put it in the indigo, and yellow and blue make green. So these are just some of the many different colors you can get if you want a little bit of color to your clothes before you make it into your cloth. So once you have your yarn and it's whatever color you want, the next step is we still have to make that into cloth. So you're going to take your yarn and the easiest way to make it into what we think of as cloth is on a loom. So this is a loom and we're going to weave the cloth on it. So some parts of the loom here, what happens is as I push on these treadles, different pieces here can come up or down. And what that's doing is raising certain strings on the loom here. And what that means is I can make these, this is called a shuttle, and it has the yarn in there. And I can make it go across and instead of having to, by hand, go over and under and over and under every single thread, by pushing these petals, I can make this go under the ones it needs to go under and over the ones it needs to go over. And then pull it. And I need to pull it tight. So I'm going to beat it in to make it nice and tight. And then change which ones are up and which ones are down to go back the other way. And I'm going to keep going back and forth in different patterns to create a cloth. Beat it. And see in this case there's green and white so I have a separate shuttle over here for when it's the turn to do the green. Let's see if I can actually one more white here, and then we can put a green through. Change which ones are up and which ones are down, and now you do that, and then you'll get a green bow. So that's weaving. So that's how you make your cloth after you have 
harvested your fiber and washed it and carded it and spun it and if you wanted to dyed it then you weave it in a cloth but when you finish with your cloth you still have to make it into whatever you're needing so these are going to be towels so there's not a whole lot more to do there's the edges i'll just hem the ends a little bit but if you were making a dress you'd have to do all the cutting and sewing of the fabric after you made all the fabric. And so that's another step in the process. This is why children and anybody a long time ago did not have a lot of clothing because you had to do all of this work to make every piece of clothes you had. And until there were mechanized ways of making this go faster, this was all done by hand for generations.